are on. All right. Uh, we are very privileged today. We've got Dave Asprey from Bulletproof, or rather from the actual creator of Bulletproof. Um, Dave, how are you, mate? I'm really, really excited to be on. Thanks for having me. No worries at all. Thanks for your time. And you've had a, you've had a pretty crazy schedule the last few weeks. You've been at Paleo FX, Longevity, and the, the new cafe in Santa Monica. I have, and along the way, I also uh, flew off to New York uh, to hang out with a bunch of other uh, like CEO health influencers. We we get together once a year. The guy who started Rodale Health, Michael Fishman, it's an invite-only thing, and then we talk about what works to help millions of people make better health decisions. Like what, how how do you reach people so that they'll do positive change? So it's kind of, kind of impactful. But man, and then I already myself less doing live. I gave another keynote. So this is like one or two and sometimes four presentations per day in multiple time zones back and forth across the country for 10 days. It was a pretty crazy trip. Wow, that's intense. So the, I've got a thousand questions for you. But we've, got, we've got a short amount of time, so we're going to try and cut to the most critical. So on, on that note of like your, your hectic schedule, um, you're, from what I've read and seen you speak, um, you're about biohacking. Yeah. And, and it, you have these these beautiful products, these coffees, um, the the proteins, the collagen. I've been trying them, feeling very very good on those things. Oh, thank um, you. No worries. Thank you for bringing it. This is the question. So, how do you work, and what is your take on adrenal fatigue? And how do people, if they're taking these um, like stimulants, like a coffee or a cacao, how do they? And and like you are traveling so much and working so hard, how do we make sure we're not going to smash our adrenals? Well, I, I've had adrenal fatigue uh, lots of times in my life, and there's kind of, in, in the Bulletproof Diet, so this is the New York Times bestselling book that I wrote, and it's a diet about willpower, and what backs up your willpower first and foremost is your mitochondria. These are the power plants in your cells, mm -hmm. and one of the things that, that controls the mitochondria is the thyroid and the adrenals it's, it's, and the uh, pituitary, the HPA access, it's called. So one of the things you're doing when you turn up the amount of energy in the body is you can rely on the adrenals for that. And that happens every time you allow a blood sugar crash or an energy crash. Okay. And what you're doing with the Bulletproof Diet is you're turning on energy from fat specifically, like you're cheating. Instead of going into full-blown ketosis, which happens when you eat no carbs, you can use the brain octane oil, which gives you a small amount of ketones even when you're burning glucose. If you're exercising heavily, if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're stressed from work, you're stressed from relationships, stressed because you have a chronic infection, it, it doesn't really matter what the stress is from. If you have a lot of stress and you have low or highly varying blood sugar, you get adrenaline to happen, adrenaline and cortisol. Why? Because those raise your blood sugar so you don't have uh, that thing that happens to animals who have no sugar in their brains, they die. Like they yeah. pass out and then animals eat them. <laughs> so our, our bodies are worried about getting eaten by tigers constantly. So what we do then for adrenal fatigue is you make sure you have lots of energy in the cells. You have enough sodium. Here's the weird thing. If you want to be weak and have fewer sex hormones, eat less salt. Mm -hmm. So the recommendations from the government right now about salt intake are so low, they actually raise heart attack risk by increasing the levels of a hormone called renin. So it's okay to have salt. If you crave salt, there's a reason. It's probably because you're stressed. So it's okay to have sea salt or Himalayan salt is even better. And that's the thing. It's the quality, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's the quality and also the ratio of sodium to magnesium and potassium. It's not that we have too much sodium. It's that we lack magnesium and potassium. So for a lot of people, in fact, the top 10 supplement list on the Bulletproof site has magnesium at the top of it. Mm -hmm. Because when you have enough magnesium, that ratio of those things changes. And then all the high blood pressure stuff that most people associate with sodium, it, it turns out it's a magnesium potassium issue, not a sodium issue. So more salt can really help with adrenal fatigue. I do a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of sea salt in a glass of water when I first wake up, which lowers the amount of adrenaline and the amount of cortisol that the body has to produce. It makes it easier. Mm -hmm. So then that saves more adrenal capacity for later. Okay. Okay. If you get better sleep, you actually, if you're healthier, you need less, less sleep. So higher quality sleep equals less sleep equals more adrenal healing. So that's how you deal with adrenal fatigue is better nutrition and avoiding the things that make you weak throughout the day. Nice. Solid. You, you're just a, a wealth of knowledge. Are you, 
I should know this, but are you, are you like, a, are you an MD? Are you a, a naturopath? What's the... I am an unlicensed biohacker. I'm okay. a computer hacker by background. I have a degree with a concentration in a subset of artificial intelligence. And I spend my career working on like, like early iterations of cloud computing. The company where Google's first servers went was a company where I started their consulting group. So my whole life has been, how do you manage and control and take over systems where you don't know much about them because other people run them? Taking over and controlling your body, that's what biohacking is. Mm -hmm. And the number one way we access our body is by changing the environment around us so that our body will respond. Because just wanting yourself to have less adrenal fatigue, it doesn't matter if you want it or didn't want it. That's not, it's not wanting, it's not willpower, it's not effort that's valuable. It's that the body responds to things like the color of the light, the temperature, and most importantly, the food you put into the body. Mm. So get enough fuel, avoid kryptonite, and there's kryptonite for everyone, and then there's kryptonite that's specific to you. And if you're doing that regularly, you will whack yourself over the head every day, and you'll never run at your full abilities. Yeah. And the final thing is get enough micronutrients. And we have a lot of well-meaning but misinformed physicians and other people who are saying, oh, it's just about micronutrients. Sorry. If you don't have enough energy in the body, micronutrients don't matter. Yeah. If you're eating kryptonite, micronutrients don't matter. So there's people out there who are like, oh, look, eat a nutrient-dense diet, which would be water and multivitamins. That's mm -hmm. what nutrient density leads you to. You start on a diet like that. And there's other people saying, oh, it has copper and vitamin C, so you should eat a lot of it. And they ignore the fact, oh, it's two pounds of cyanide with some copper on top, then you should eat it. Well, no. You should avoid bad things before you start focusing on good things. Yeah. And when you follow that order, which is the, the genesis and the basis of the Bulletproof Diet, basically you're wired to kick ass all day. Nice, solid. And that's the thing, it's so specific to the individual. If, if someone's like eating almond butter, for one person that's beautiful, but another person that might be all damp and have allergens to tree nuts, they're in a mess, right? Well, you, you said it. And on the Bulletproof Diet, there's this one-page infographic you can download for free. You don't have to buy my book to, to get it. The book explains more. But uh, I give this away for free, and I gave it away before I even started, uh, even wrote the book, because it's that important. And it has kind of three categories for food. There's kryptonite food. Just don't eat that. You want to be a high performer? You really don't need MSG and margarine in your life. And if you put them in there, you will not you will not do all the things you could do. Even if you can, quote, handle it, it's not anywhere near the best. Mm. There's this whole set of suspect foods. Okay, lentils mess up a lot of people, but for you, they might be an acceptable carb source. Depends on your genetics, maybe your gut biome. So if you don't know that they might be making you weak, you could eat them every day because lentils are good. I mean, good people eat lentils. If you don't like lentils, you're a bad person. Yeah. <laughs> right? So we have these weird beliefs, a raw kale, which also messes up a lot of people. Yeah. So you, you go through these, these categories, like, okay, why don't I just eliminate all the suspects at one time and just eat the bulletproof foods at the very top? Just do it for, for 14 days is what I recommend in the book. And at the end of 14 days, you're like, I had no food cravings. I feel amazing. I kick ass all day. Like, I want to be like this every day. And then you add in some suspect foods. You're like, oh, my God. I ate something, and now I, I, I'm a zombie again. This is how I used to feel. Like, all right, maybe it was tomatoes. Maybe it was potatoes. But those are suspect foods because, like, some substantial percentage of people get rheumatoid arthritis from those foods. But if you never eliminate them, or you eliminate only potatoes but not tomatoes, you and they're both bothering you, sorry, you can't tell who's guilty and who's not. So get rid of all the suspects and just do that really clean thing for a little while and you will feel like a different person. Solid. So it's tuning back in, isn't it? Finding what your base level is and, yep. and yeah, recalibrating. Beautiful, nice. Um, so you speak uh, on your, your blog, and, and I've heard you reference before a little bit, a little bit about epigenetics. And uh, so, uh, you, you know, you've heard of Bruce Lipton, I'm guessing. I actually wrote about him uh, in my first book uh, quite a bit, and he spoke at the anti-aging research group that I run. So yeah, I, I, Bruce is an amazing guy. Yeah, solid. And uh, so, I, and I. I haven't actually read that we're going to take a little sidestep, but I want to pull this out of you as well. You have another book called The Better Baby Book. Yep. Yeah. So is, are you pulling in epigenetics in there? It, it's basically the first hands-on guide for epigenetics. When epigenetics first came out, like, oh, look, the environment tunes your, your genes. It tells what genes get turned on and get turned off. The only problem is, okay, now we have this precious knowledge. What do you do with it? And then you have all these crickets chirping, and then you have some you know, guys in white lab coats saying, we're not really sure yet. Mm -hmm. 
right? And until we're sure, we're just going to eat Big Macs and, and pizza. That is irrational at its core. <laughs> yeah. We know there's an effect. So doing nothing versus let's do what we think is best, given the totality of evidence, even if we don't know for sure, oh, my God, that's what, that's what we do in tech. Well, we're not sure. The system's not working very well. Or we're getting reproductively weaker each generation. So we could do nothing, or we could do the most likely thing that, that's going to work. And I outlined all the evidence. That about 1,300 studies went into writing the Better Baby book. And it's what we used to turn my wife's fertility back on. My wife is a Karolinska-trained uh, physician mm-hmm. in one of the top 10 med schools on the planet in Stockholm, Sweden. And she was infertile when I met her. The Bulletproof Diet, when you look at the fertility version of it, that's what's in the Better Baby book. Okay, okay. So she was infertile, then you just you tweaked the foods and supplements and then I, back on. Yeah, I, I created the diet, looked at scrupulous avoidance of anti-nutrients that get in the way of fertility, learned a lot from what funny ranchers know. Because in their cases, oh look, we're making less money because half our cows or pigs can't reproduce. What do they do? What do they eliminate? Like, what are the variables that they found? Because they have really tight control over what they feed their animals, but we don't have control over what we feed ourselves because we don't have good studies for that. They're all like self-reporting and all. So like, hmm, what causes atherosclerotic lesions in pigs? Oh, funny. It's low quality feed. Mm -hmm. Could the same things that they've identified that they have lab tests for, so you can test the feed before you give to the pig. Could we care about those? Yeah. By the way, I'm talking about toxins from mold in food, which is a major issue for humans. It's just, it's a very, you eat it, and then you get an effect that can be months or years later. So long feedback time things, humans are not very good at seeing. Yeah. So ranchers are good at that, humans aren't. So I generalized some of that, we tested it, and it's kind of amazing. Uh, Lana's fertility turned back on, and we had two kids, one at 39, one at 42, wow. um, without any fertility assistance. And she runs a fertility coaching practice using her medical knowledge and the knowledge that we developed to have our own family. Hey, that's beautiful. That's really beautiful. Yeah, good work. Good job. Thank you. Um, okay, we're gonna, there's mycotoxins. We're going to hold that in the air there and do a, do a little loop around back to it. Um, I want to speak, and I know I didn't send this to you as a prep, but I've also heard you reference in um, birth control, and and I think that's a really key topic that a lot of so many women, well, men, I haven't got a clue for the most part, and women even just dismiss it and just trust that pill or the the the, the coil. And I know you guys have quite a lot of expertise on that. What's your yeah. advice on birth control? There's a we wrote a lot in the Better Baby book. I didn't write so much in the Bulletproof Diet about it, but mm. here's the, the two big things about birth control pills. And this is why um, I would encourage you to not use the pill. It, it's not like the downside isn't worth it. Uh, it's important to not get pregnant until you decide to get pregnant, but the pill is probably the most harmful way, but it's one of those things that causes damage down the road. Mm. There's definitely an association with, with breast cancer and with other hormonal problems. But the worst part is it changes your ability to sense pheromones. So we have this really nice system where if someone smells sexy, we'll be attracted to them. Yeah. But birth control pills change your sense of sexy in smell. So the guy that's like, oh God, he's so hot, I'm taking the pill. <laughs> you get married and you're like, all oh, right, I, this is perfect, like so hot. And then you stop taking the pill and your sense of pheromones change and all of a sudden he's not hot anymore. Uh-huh. because your body is selecting a mate that's genetically compatible with you using these very subtle environmental signals. And you hacked those signals. You broke your ability to sense appropriately using the pill. Mm. So all of a sudden you go off the pill and you're like, oh, man, I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm married. I guess I'll have kids. And your kids maybe, you know, your body picks a mate for a reason. Not that you consciously pick one. No, he's a good earner. He's beautiful. I like his family. He's going to be a good dad. Uh, you know, he takes care of me. All those things. But if, it, if your body's like, oh, my God, don't have sex with him. He's not the right genetic compatibility with you. Okay, then what's going to happen? Stress. And then with stress, adrenal fatigue. It makes you weak. And then, you know, the whole thing starts to suck. Yeah. Good. Good. So, so Good. I've got time for, like, one more question. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. So I'm, I'm going to make it really quick. So this one is a quick yes or no answer. Um, speaking about, like, the, the foods that we're eating today, the, the government controlling, the FDA and all that kind of stuff, uh, is this, in your opinion, is this some sort of really funny conspiracy? Do they know they're doing this to people at like the infertility rates, or is it just an accident? I don't 
believe a lot in conspiracies. And part of this is I've had a chance to hang out with billionaires, but more than a few of them. And you know what? The vast majority of them really are working to, to help people. And some of them are just selfish bastards, but they're the exceptions, not the rule. Uh, a lot of these behaviors come from mistaken assumptions. So if you believe one thing that isn't true, and then you act in a whole bunch of ways on top of that one thing, then you'll come up making a system that doesn't work very well. There's also something called emergent behavior. And we've documented this extensively in nature and on the internet where I've learned about this kind of stuff. You can take a tiny rule that says, do this thing which seems harmless, replicate it you know, 10 gazillion times, and it creates what appears to be a complex conspiracy-like behavior. So if you were to say, create some rules, and the basic rule is, say around food, make the most profitable food. What you will inevitably create is a food that is highly addictive that causes cravings. Why? So you'll sell more of it. You don't do it on purpose, although I think there are some scientists who are like, oh, this does induce cravings, but you could say a craving is a bad thing, or you could say it means they like it. Yeah. Right? I feed it to them, then they want more, so it's good. And when they want more, they buy more. What if we cut the calories so they're hungry all the time? That's even better, so they'll buy more. We can charge more for a 100-calorie bar. My bar has like 220-something calories in it, but you eat it, and you're not going to be hungry for several hours. Mm -hmm. Like I would make more money if I made a bar where you eat one bar every hour. I just won't do it, yeah. <laughs> right? So it's that, that mindset, which is like what comes first. If, if profits are the most important thing, we get diet sodas. They make you fat but you drink them because you're fat. It's the perfect business model. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, thank you, thanks, good answer. Um, okay, and to finish, so I, want, I, want, I really want you to correct this and pull this out of the bag, okay? So I love what you're doing and I love, I love the cafe, I'm gonna be in there and I'm into your products. I, I love it, I've got this, this document here all about the mycotoxins I've been looking. <laughs> correct it, come on. What's going you know, on? It I referenced 34 studies on mycotoxins. I run lab tests on mine. In fact, I was inspired by that whole thing to film a documentary about mold toxins where I interviewed some of the top experts in the world on mold toxins. In the video, I have a former president of the Specialty Coffee Association of America on record saying, oh yeah, I was in Japan when the Japan trade minister rejected a thousand containers of coffee as being too moldy for Japanese consumers. And I said, so Mark, what happened to those? Ooh. And he said, oh, they got shipped to the US. Ooh. Now, maybe you believe in the US that, well, the toxins are at government mandated safe limits, therefore they do not exist. I don't believe that. And I, I see the difference. In fact, I measured the difference and published the studies in my book, which hit the New York Times list. And it says there's a statistically significant difference in people who consume lab tested coffee, they perform better on small tests of cognitive function. So like I respect our ability to, to disagree on things like that. In this case, the totality of evidence is there and it is part of my personal mission to show people that these things that appear to not matter because they don't affect some people the way they affect other people, uh, that there's overwhelming evidence that ranchers and farmers care about these because they're affecting human fertility. They're contributing to things like autism. They're contributing to massive food allergies and massive autoimmunity. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty easy to stand up there and thump your chest and say, these don't matter. This is not the truth. They matter, and they matter more than people uh, understand right now. So I will help them see that, whether or not they ever buy my coffee. I'm also lobbying to change regulations so the U.S. will be on par with Venezuela and China, not to mention all of Europe and Japan and Singapore and Indonesia, because they protect their populations. And because the U.S. is not protecting the population, we are not getting the same quality coffee the rest of the world gets. We get the lowest quality moldiest coffee because it's legal to sell here. This is a true fact with the top guys in the industry saying it. And it doesn't matter whether someone says I'm wrong or I'm a scumbag or whatever else they're saying about it. I don't listen to that. I don't spend my time on it. Because whether or not that's true, maybe I am a scumbag, what I'm saying about mold is absolutely true. There is so much evidence. You can deny the evidence. You can bring in shills to say it. But if you're trying to sell coffee that's not tested, that's kind of an important thing that we should talk about. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much. You got it, man. I love your mission. Good work. I'll see you in the cafe soon. Thanks. Catch you later. Cheers, mate. Cheers. Subscribe, 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 subscribe.